All right, we are recording. So again, welcome, and uh, we are recording today's presentation in case you come in late or would like to review. We archive it on our website. Just a quick introduction uh, to give you a verbal of the information you see on the screen. Uh, my name is Glenn Thompson. I've been working as a mentor with Pacific Trading Academy for since its inception almost 15 years ago. Uh, we're located in Southern California. If you want to contact us, you can use the contact information that you see. Our toll-free is 800-339-8588. Uh, you can also take a look at the website, www.pacifictradingacademy.com. If you'd like to get more details concerning any of the programs, uh, or specifically programs in terms of my teaching and trading and any related activity, uh, either talk to Peter Newman or Frank Cameron right now temporarily. Uh, he's working to help Peter um, probably through the summer. But in any case, uh, either of those two gentlemen would be the people that you would talk to if you want to get more information. Uh, but initially, you can contact us at the con with the contact information you see on the screen. Again, welcome. Today's presentation is How Market Timing Can Supercharge Your Trading Edge. And let's roll the uh, tape, so to speak. All right. All right. Uh, and I want to start <clears throat> by saying that uh, uh, this is a rebroadcast of uh, a, a presentation I've given uh, uh, maybe a few times over the last two or three years. Uh, I try and kind of space out different topics uh, so as to have a, good, a diversity of ideas that will make sense. Um, but I haven't talked about timing, I think, at least in for at least a couple of quarters, maybe half a year or so. Uh, for the traders that I consult and mentor and coach, uh, if any of you are listening in, you obviously know that timing is critical to the analysis part, part of what I do. I'm certainly operating from a technical uh, standpoint, but timing is uh, uh, the, the cornerstone and the pivot of most of what I do. Timing should always take precedence over price. Um, let me explain that. I think from a cause and effect standpoint, all of the price action that you see in terms of a market uh, has its ultimate origin and starting point based on certain specific uh, time periods that have elapsed. Uh, I do believe in the uh, bottom line premise of all technical analysis that price and price change discounts uh, all information known or unknown out there in the world external to the market but if you want to get a, a keener uh, more comprehensive insight in terms of what makes markets tick I believe you have to look at certain time relationships uh, from a practical standpoint I'm quick to point out I'm not suggesting necessarily traders make trading decisions and place orders and establish positions in markets uh, solely on time consideration. I am suggesting at minimum you want to take a look at some timing procedures and projection methods and models uh, possibly to complement your price analysis. And I think in doing so you will serve, that will serve to improve your odds and your edge. And uh, we know in a broader uh, sense uh, market, the analysis part of this business is based on probabilities and trying to procure as much edge as you can. Uh, I should have mentioned in the, in the intro, if you have questions as we proceed, you can jot them in on the uh, right area, the right side of your screen, and I'll kind of progress. Very good. Thank you. Uh, and then we'll have time at the end of the presentation for any questions concerning topics related to this or, or anything uh, related to financial speculation, because that's what we've been doing. I did. I should also mention that even though I've been teaching for just, to put it in the context, 15 years with PTA, I've been trading uh, almost, or well, more than double that. I've been, most of my career was back east and, and Wall Street and the environs. And then I had my first teaching experience in coaching uh, when I moved to the West Coast and have been doing so, as I said, for 15 years. And I still actively trade my own accounts. That's how I earn most of my, I make my money. All right. Timing should take precedence over price. This is not an idea that originated with me. People like Gann and Jensen and Wyckoff and uh, numerous other traders over the years uh, buy into this concept. Uh, however popular it is, it is 
a minority view. Probably, I always tell people, less than 5% of traders use timing. The fact that such a small percentage of traders incorporate timing uh, is reason sufficient to take a look at some of the timing methods uh, because it will by that the the scarcity of approach will give you the trader who does uh, apply and utilize a tool that's not widely used some edge just by virtue of it being different and uh, separate and um, uh, uh, not ubiquitous all right let's move on and I want to show you some of the ways in which we do this and some of the results that we can achieve in our timing. GAN's insight of uh, vibration key to markets. Uh, time, vibration, uh, and I'll give you kind of some in theoretical ideas as to how I do uh, make some of the projections that I make. Vibration is uh, leads to repetition, which leads to infinity. Infinity is kind of uh, this concept that has to do with in between. Uh, I, it, it brings up is Zeno's paradox. In other words, if you're trying to get from point A to point B in on route, you always have to go half the distance, and in doing so, you never quite make it to your destination. So we look at your objective or your destination more or less as a limit. Um, all right. This, uh, so I, this is those of you who've been following my presentations over the years may recall this slide. I kind of enjoy it. It's a little dynamic. Uh, interplay between uh, the current slide and the subsequent slide. The sentence on the next slide is true, so let's focus on the meaning embedded in this, in the context here. The sentence on the next slide, on the next slide is true, and I have an arrow pointing, uh, kind of a guide, or, or guide to the next slide. Uh, the sentence on the previous slide is false. All right, so we have an arrow pointing, leading us or directing us back to the preceding slide to procure the meaning from it. Well, let's back up and think about this. Um, as I read each sentence and, and kind of uh, interpret logically its meaning, one slide's meaning negates the other, and it creates this oscillation which if you get inside, if you put yourself in, from an interpretational standpoint in that loop, you more or less create a permanent standing wave of, of, of viewpoint, of oscillation. Uh, and so this is, you know, people like Gann, and he's certainly not the first, um, uh, Newton, Galileo, a lot of the natural thinkers of natural law and people who were trying to understand this hundreds, if not, you know, years ago beyond that, uh, realized that vibration, waves, uh, was the key to all life. It certainly is the underlying component and construct of energy. The sentence on the previous slide is false. Well, let's go back. The sentence on the next slide is true. But the preceding slide just said that this slide is incorrect. So there is, it, it just forces us back to oscillate back and forth, back and forth like this, creating an oscillation, which in turn creates a wave. And so that's a, uh, a very, this is just pointing out uh, as best I can demonstrate in a, in a uh, with this, uh, back and forth toggling of, this, of the key on my keyboard, uh, the principle that creates or can create a wave. All right. Energy, the need for survival versus my cup runneth over idea. All objects absorb and reflect energy. Uh, the reason, by the way, folks, so you know, because we have, I haven't shown any charts yet of markets, so you might be wondering why am I talking about energy when this is supposed to be a trading webinar concerning timing. Well, Energy has to, I believe that markets reverse their direction uh, as a result of certain energy uh, thresholds uh, being uh, uh, eclipsed. And an energy threshold will be eclipsed when a system absorbs a certain amount of energy uh, beyond its capacity. So that's the reason for this. I just want to give you a little theoretical insight in terms of uh, some of the models uh, and they're the models that I use to make projections or predictions into the future as to when a market's going to change its direction. And that is the ultimate utility of market timing. Uh, if you look at any textbook or TA or technical analysis treaties, uh, Murphy's book, Schwager, any of the standard analysis books on analyses or any uh, uh, respect, uh, respected source or treatise or document concerning how to do market analysis, 
80 if not more percent of the content concerns price as it should but again the neglected component or dimension of market analysis the horizontal axis is time and so I want to give some uh, focus and attention to the uh, alternate coordinate complementary coordinate of our two-dimensional array by which we evaluate and study market behavior the whole point of which is to attempt to better exploit that behavior that motion of that system for profit okay so all objects absorb and reflect energy this is a universal truth every object has its particular frequency at which it best takes in energy as well as those frequencies that are reflected well that's that's how we determine for example uh, any attribute of any object or system if I look across the room at um, in my kitchen table and see an apple sitting on the table and I and you ask me or I want to determine the color of the apple if it's a red apple let's just say the reason I am able to figure that out or make that come to that conclusion is all of the light that is uh, external to that apple that somehow uh, bumps off of or, or bounces off of that object that apple in this case all of the wavelengths of, of light uh, some of which are absorbed uh, but whatever wavelengths are not absorbed by the skin of that apple and its and its molecular structure the wavelengths that happen to be reflected for whatever reason based on uh, them those particular wavelengths not having a reconciliation a, a means of accepting or receiving but rather they reflect or cause certain wavelengths to bounce off those particular wavelengths uh, length of wave or frequency inversely one in the same phenomenon are what my retina in my eye picks up and it's a particular amount or distance of wavelength and we call it a color we have in our English language or any language for that matter uh, if it's a certain frequency of oscillation we might call it red or green depending on the uh, particular molecular and ultimately atomic and even sub a subatomic structure of the skin uh, making up that uh, the outer outer portion of that piece of fruit uh, if I call it red it's because red is simply a particular wavelength of energy uh, and we utilize uh, in our language in the English language the word red let's say to denote a certain frequency of oscillation or wavelength um, the the freak the colors that if any color other than what I determine that Apple let's say to be um, are go undetected because they are absorbed in the structure or in the skin of that piece of fruit and as such I don't see them I see what is reflected and what registers in my understanding and through my visual mechanism ie my retina and the uh, neuronal network that interprets it in my thing in my brain let's say in this respect financial markets are the same as any other object at frequencies specific to different markets a market will resonate with certain energy impacting it so the energies that resonate are absorbed by and this applies to an apple and it applies to a financial market any energy impacting a financial market so let's think of a stock it could be Goldman Sachs it could be Google it could be Apple it could be Baidu it could be potash it could be crude oil as a derivative commodity and energy market it could be the bond market albeit these are very complicated objects their complication arises for many reasons in part because it has there are many variables that determine their behavior and because it's dynamic the dynamism implicit and uh, and creating the flux and the change it's not a static system uh, certainly ramps up the the uh, degree of complexity of, of a financial market nevertheless however complex they are they resonate with certain energy frequencies external to it and those are the energies that are absorbed the, the specific frequencies or wavelengths of energy to which a financial market be it crude oil be it the S&P 500 or be it Apple computer or Microsoft or Bank America whatever energy that's in the world external to that financial system that does that it does not resonate with are the energies that are reflected and it's that reflected energy that we are able to um, see and based on the reflection and the carom and the, the the result of the interaction 
we as observers of the financial market are then able to interpret some aspect by inference uh, uh, some attribute of that market's behavior. At frequencies specific to different markets, a market will resonate with certain energy impacting it. Should a market receive too much energy, its structure will explode. This is the phenomena that ends trends. A technician calls a, a, an ending of a trend a market top or a bottom or a pivot point. We have different words in the language to define an, enter, an underlying deeper rooted energetic phenomena. Same idea, just different modes and mechanisms of explanation and description. That's all. Anyway, that will have, this is very important. I believe, theoretically, the reason a market top or bottom, a turn occurs, is because the system, the market in question, has filled up in terms of energy beyond its lid, its capacity to contain any additional energy. The energy must go somewhere. If you fill a container, uh, to the tip, over, eventually it will need to go, it has to uh, occupy a space or volume. If there is no more space in said object or system, whatever it is, it will have to some way force its way out. If there's an obvious opening, it will merely flow in, in the direction where there is additional space. If it's a closed container, ultimately, if somehow there's an, uh, a, a constant flow inflow, it will explode and break beyond its boundaries. The system explodes. This is what stops a trend in its motion. This is So there's a paradigm shift. Most traders look at a price chart, and this is the standard, not the only way by which we can follow and observe and interpret market behavior on a two-dimensional uh, uh, plot of prices as, as a function of time. Not the only way, but it's a standard way. Um, most traders look at the tops and bottoms and we think of that and most uh, forms of analysis are slated to try and help us figure out when the top and bottom is going to occur. Uh, the opposite paradigm is to assume uh, or to take and interpret a top or a bottom as, a, as an extraordinary event because it's correlated with a overflow. There has been a spillage at the, at the filling pump, if you will, in a figurative sense. Energy generation in a wheel. Need to divide the circle into equal parts. Harmonic table. It turns out, and I'm jumping around, I'm going to tie a lot of these theoretical, these disparate theoretical points together by the end of today's presentation. A circle. There are a number of geometric uh, polygons in particular, or shapes. Circle, square, and triangle, uh, as far as everything I've learned in 30-some years of analysis and trading, the circle is the preeminent and the most critically and integral geometric structure uh, for market analysis. It allows me to project time targets in the future and also price targets. Um, the square and the triangle are also important, but the circle, because it has infinite symmetry, um, it, it, and that meaning that there's all sorts of manipulations of the structure. Um, the, the, you can revolve it, you can rotate it, uh, you can shift it in space, um, but regardless of the an infinite amount of manipulation, it's still, you don't change any aspect of it, unlike any other structure. And so when we consider a circle uh, from an energetic standpoint, um, there are certain fractional parts of a circle which have particular uh, harmonic relations uh, not only to financial markets but in a broader sense uh, in our entire universe. And I want to show how I utilize this to, again, project time targets out in the future. When you break a circle up into, when you, when you keep a circle intact, in other words, if, you, if there are zero uh, fractional parts of, a, say, a 360-degree circle, what's referred to a conjunction, uh, zero degrees of separation. If you were to divide a circle of 360 degrees into two, it, each, each section would be 180 degrees. Three or a trine, 120 degrees. These are just certain specific fractional parts of a circle. The ones that are listed, listed here, the divisions of the circle, and certainly there are many others, I could arbitrarily select alternate divisions of a circle. The reason I have chosen to list this on the slide is these are ones in particular which 
tend to allow for energy. If you were to circulate energy, a standing wave around the, in, the, in, the, the insides of a circle, along these certain fractional parts, it would tend to sustain the energy. And that's what's important. A sustenance of energy in a circle, in the interior of a circle, uh, according to these specific fractional parts, what are referred to as aspects or, or harmonics, tend to reinforce and thereby sustain the flow and the transfer and the conveyance of energy. And this will have uh, practical consequences in terms of understanding market motion and behavior. This is just a further explanation. Energy created by certain angular configurations is self-sustaining. It will reinforce itself over and over as it moves around the circle. So, for example, if we look at the picture, the graphic on the left side of the slide, let's say you're on, a per, on the circumference of the circle at zero degrees due east, point B. If I were to somehow throw a projectile exactly 90 degrees away, that's one quarter of the circle, it tends to, you know, energy in equals energy out, or angle of incidence equals angle of uh, reflection. That's, a un that's another universal concept. Sometimes I forget to make explicit some of these principles. This applies in every, everything that we know. That's just a law of, uh, a natural law. It's a law of physics. Uh, so angle of ins, uh, it, if it applies if you're shooting a billiard ball on a pool table, or let's say, the angle of attack equals the angle of reflection. And so you can see that that phenomena repeated as it makes its way around the internal uh, fractional portions of the circle at 90 degree increments ultimately leads back to the same starting point and the process continues until it just dies out eventually in the limit. In the real world, because of we have drag and friction and uh, opposing external forces, things don't repeat infinitely. Like the previous slide where we were saying the information on the subsequent slide is true. And then when you get to that, when you arrive at that slide, the message is the information on the previous seating slide was false. And it forces you to create a bouncing behavior of infinite back and forth. Theoretically, that will go on forever. Were it not for wind resistance and drag or and or in a figurative sense at least if not a practical real sense of contrary forces that interfere with it, uh, the sustenance or persistence of a motion of, uh, of energy. Uh, so this this certain particular fractional part 90 degrees if we go back to the pre 90 degrees is what's called uh, a square or one quarter of the circle. 90 degrees of separation. That tends to be one of the harmonic divisions of a circle that tends to reinforce and thereby uh, work towards sustenance of energy flow. Create standing wave or constructive or construction. Versus, let's say I alter the angle, the harmonic, the angular relationship with which I choose to um, project a projectile towards a target within the, on the, along the internal or the inside portion of the circumference of a circle. If I just were to adjust that to, say, 80 degrees, I move up along the circumference so that my the distance travels just 80 degrees along that 360-degree uh, circle, you still have the same phenomena. Principles don't break down. We just, they're because you are utilizing a different fractional part or a different harmonic of the circle, certain harmonics uh, are not energy sust sustaining, but rather energy draining. Uh, they tend to not reinforce, but ultimately uh, sooner rather than later die out. So the same principle, angle in equals the angle of uh, departure. And they do, it, this uh, when it gets travels one full turn around the circle, it doesn't exactly end up at its starting point. And so this the energy doesn't reinforce, but rather is destructive and this creates a non-standing wave. This is simply a theoretical model to illustrate uh, an energetic concept uh, as to why trends will either sustain or a trend will at some point uh, perish. And when a trend dies out or is con uh, conclusion concluded, that opens by default the way for a new trend to begin. 
Thus, we call it a top or a bottom. Those are just upper level manifestations of an underlying energetic phenomena. This is part of, this is a major reason why these phenomena in markets uh, occur. I want to show you something, I want to give you some steps as to how I do specific projections. This is just one of many, a general guiding concept of all technical analysis, and in fact, to broader, a broader, to generalize this, all analysis, whether I'm a fundamental, uh, utilizing a fundamental approach, a quantitative approach, or a technical approach. In general, it's never good, and I tell traders that I work with and have been telling them this for years because I learned this somewhere along the way early on in my career, you should never depend on a single analytical idea, model, concept, indicator, relationship. You could, if you could identify, theoretically if it were possible, the single perfect, certainly reliable concept or principle. I am not aware of anything, any one concept, relationship, or, mo or market model that's perfect. If I were, I jokingly tell people I'd keep it to myself. Um, I say that facetiously all to throw it out there. However, in all seriousness, I mean that because that's in a, because to the extent it becomes the something that is perfect in a theoretical ideal sense becomes more and more pervasive. The interesting irony of that is it will it, it's its perfection will ultimately trail off because the market be, by virtue of the system that we're playing in financial markets are in the business of discounting information and to the extent as history has shown us over the years not only in the field of ah someone saying you lost the audio thank you geo for uh, let's see lost audio Let's check this. Can you hear me now? Back? No? Hold on. Uh, back? I'm getting mixed responses, folks. Fine here. It may be whoever, maybe it's something individual to your system. Okay, you're, you have it. All right, guys. I appreciate that. Okay, good. Great. Okay, I'll continue. So let me just, yeah, it, I'll just, I want to pay attention to that. So if there are any problems, Good. Maybe it was a temporary issue in the line, but in any cases, uh, hopefully we're fine from now. All right. Steps to determine cycle endpoints. Um, locate high. This is a, a, a particular technique. It's not the only technique I use to know when and project when in the future uh, a market's going to turn. By the way, let me just qualify this. Market timing, most of the techniques I use, and there are many uh, people write books on this. There have been many different techniques by which you can project. Oh, thank you. Someone's saying if you can't, uh, if you're losing any portion of the broadcast, audio or visual, log out and re-log in. Just might be a clearing of your system. Great. I appreciate that. All right. One of the one of the ideas I utilize that borrows from the circular energy harmonics of a circle. It's not the only idea, although I believe many, if not most, or all of the time techniques that I use, uh, even if they're not directly related to this energetic concept, um, a lot of them, if they are really reliable, tend to borrow heavily from this idea. So this is a very specific set of rules that I use to know in advance when a market's going to turn. By the way, when I derive that information, what, it, what does it give me? What's the output of this form of analysis? It generates dates in the future. Or, by the way, I can do the same thing for sure. If I'm a day trader, I'm working on a minute chart, a 60-second chart, or a 10-minute chart, or a 5-minute chart, or whatever intraday, higher frequency activity. Timing, you know, markets don't know anything. If you're trading, if you're a stock trader and you're trading Apple, Apple doesn't know anything about you, the fact that you are observing its motion on a daily chart or a 10-minute chart or a 60-second chart or a tick chart or a weekly or a quarterly chart. Market motion, quite what academics and market researchers uh, more astutely refer to as price returns, prices just flow forward through time. You and I and people who study markets and, and exploit them for profit and traders and investors in general, we for 
uh, for make in order to make more sense out of what would otherwise be chaotic activity, we compartmentalize and parse the data, the changes of price return or action from one price level to another, and we locate it and study and observe its behavior in increments of time, be it a, a tick chart on one extreme, let's say, all the way up to long-term charts. I can monitor the behavior of a market from that market's inception in any increment of time with the technology we have in 2015 uh, in very, very, very short um, amounts of time or relatively longer periods of time if I'm interested in a longer-term view, depending on your focus and your objectives. Uh, my point here is, for before I get into the, deep, the steps of this slide, is that the at its best, market timing doesn't tell me anything about price. All it tells me is when I can expect, say, change. And that's the broadest sense. One form of change is trend reversal. By the way, it's not the only type of change. And another type of obvious change would be a shift or a deceleration or an acceleration. In other words, the velocity of trend may change. Now, for convenience, we normally think uh, and a most obvious and practically beneficial uh, type of change for our purposes, it would be to know when in advance a market's going to form a top or a bottom. So I can extract some practical edge. I can get positioned before the crowd does, either long or short, let's just say. But that's, that's the practical exploitation of, an, of these ideas. My point here is the, the point in the utility and the fruit of market timing, the output, doesn't necessarily, although there are some techniques that are specific and will not only generate a time target, but a, com a concomitant or con corresponding price target. Most of the tools and models and projection methodologies that I employ um, are very singular and pure in the sense that they generate a time point. I in principle, if nothing else, that allows me or creates a greater than average expectation or anticipation for a change in that market system or mode of behavior to occur, I then focus on my price, the price features of that market. At the time I arrive or when we arrive or when the market arrives at that projected theoretical time point, I would, that's cause sufficient for me to then ask, do I see data from a price vantage point that would align with that? Do I see divergence, let's say, if I'm expecting a reversal? Do I see some other um, features peculiar or indicative of change, let's say a reversal? If so, I essentially interpret that to mean uh, a higher probability. I have more edge and have greater correlation for a change to occur. Better trade location. All right, locate, here's how you do this, or one technique that I employ, very specific. So you're not going to leave here today without getting something that you can actually apply, even though I'm, there, there are certain tools. This is, a, this is a relatively sophisticated technique that I want to show. Locate high or low day. By the way, for those of you who are short-term day traders, same concept. Instead of it just in place of high or low day, high or low on your intraday chart, a pivot top or a bottom. If I'm on a five-minute, I, by the way, in my trading on the S&P, which I day trade, I utilize a four-minute chart, um, four-minute because it's intimately tied into uh, the planetary, the Earth's cycle, um, uh, and it's tied into the harmonic of, of 24 that I will talk about later. But locate high or low point. If you're looking to make a projection out into the future for a position or a swing trade or a longer-term investment, it would be typically on a, on, a, on a time frame chart greater than an intraday chart, so it would be a high or low day. Again, if it's a day trading situation, I'm going to do everything in terms typically of minutes and I'm going to be doing the analysis on an intraday chart, say a four minute chart or a 10 minute or say whatever it is. But the concept will scale. It's the same idea just depending on the time frame you're interested in and what your objectives are. On the high or low day, observe the aspects that the fast planets form with the slow. Whoa, well, I just made a jump because I had not talked about that. Let's just see. Just just think, okay, here's this. Uh, for those of you who are not, um, who, uh, let me just bridge this gap here. I just jumped to uh, talking about slow and fast planets. And I didn't, 
a sim I didn't uh, transition uh, I made a, a quick jump um, here's a thought remember I said think about energy moving on a circle the reason or a reason I, I, I'm oversimplifying here for time purposes but I want to indicate think of planets in our solar system more or less and uh, again it is a a real world or a real universe or a real galaxy description or example of a module that I alluded to in the previ previous slides that is the circle a circle or some uh, manifestation of a circular type structure uh, it will be at an ellipse or a circle or something akin to a circle um, and remember I made the example of I said if imagine yourself to be on the circumference of a circle where you throw a projectile a given distance to another point on the circumference well by analogy we have a real universal system that is our solar system the center of the circle or the center of our solar system being our star or our Sun and as the planets move around in their orbits it's analogous to energy being shifted from one point on the circumference of this celestial circle to another same idea enacted in a actual physical system in our world in our universe that surrounds us so here's the idea when fast planets what are fast planets the ones that are closer to the center point of the circle they are closer to our Sun moon mercury Venus Mars and the Sun is considered for technical reasons to be a fast planet when the fast planets uh, uh, form what are called aspects these are certain harmonic or angular relationships people who do this type of analysis simply refer to those angular harmonics that are important as aspects just terminology conventional uh, verbiage that's all don't worry about that when fast planets recreate angular relationships or aspects with the slow that correlates with the cycle endpoint so for example let's go back and show how and nope oh, where's my okay here's if I if I see two planets in their revolutions around the center of their circle they're around in their orbits let's say that happen to be uh, 120 degrees away that would be a particular aspect or angular relationship that tends to support and create energy and certain markets tend to uh, uh, respond to that if or or a if two planets happen to be 90 degrees apart what's called a square that tends to be another situation these are the most important there are others but these are the uh, five most important uh, there are some others that are important but I wanted to just for simplicity's sake indicate five of the most important ones okay again very procedurally locate a top or a bottom regardless of for and this applies to all markets whether you're trading stocks indices derivatives commodities currencies uh, spot Forex etc and it applies to all time frames whether I'm on one extreme a short day trade trader high frequency or long-term investor in all time continuums on the interim and the spectrum of times possible you identify uh, on a pivot point in a, a day that sticks out historically on the chart of the history of that market and at a turning point and you then take a look and observe and there are ways we can do this we have what we call ephemerides and ephemeris programs that do this uh, are there any what are the particular aspects between the these units these entities these celestial bodies these fast planets with slower planets okay the slow ones are the outer planets things like Saturn Uranus uh, Pluto Neptune um, when there are certain angular relationships the five in the, that the previous slide indicated between these items here these celestial bodies here the faster planets and the outer bodies planets things like uh, and the you know uh, that's an indication when you see that that is an indication that at that point in the time in the past they were present so when those fast planets recreate aspects the similar relationships that that indicates or lets you know 
when in the future you can expect a similar type of overflow of energy, that is a top or a bottom. You may not know at the time you're doing this if the projected uh, uh, recreation of a similar type aspect is going to correspond and manifest as a top or a bottom. What you do know is you can expect there's a much greater than average probability for a reversal to occur. I always tell people you can begin as you get closer and closer to a raw, to, as you get more and more proximal to a projected time point, simply watch the trend. Common sense. There is There are times when common sense will, will work to your advantage. There are times when it works against you. You, at, from a simplistic starting point, always assume what is the market doing? The question I ask, bottom line, What's the market, the acid test, what's the market doing as it arrives at a projected time target? If it's rising, I'm expecting more likely the market will fill, that will be its pulling into the filling station where it's more likely going to be overfilled and break down. That marks a breakdown of that trend. It's ending, allowing for the onset of an alternate type of motion because the system is filled up beyond the brim of its capacity, it's got to stop. Something has to, there's a destruction of one type of behavior allowing for an onset of an alternate type of behavior. So this is a very simple step-by-step -step procedural guideline of a protocol by which I begin the process of working out at least some rough ideas as to when I can expect uh, changes in a system, i.e. reversals in trend to occur. That's one idea. A second idea, I apply harmonics of 90 projection and look for convergences, a third time period projection. Now, I am, you don't, you may not know what that is. Well, let's see. Oh, I'll explain in, uh, not, I thought it was the next slide, but this is just a simple way in which I did this to show how I did this. Here's what I did, cycle progression. This is a, a slide that I didn't, I could have re, um, didn't have time last night to when I was preparing this. This is just a, a couple of years ago, December S&P of 2013. I make no bones about that. I'm going to show you some up some slides I pulled from this week. But um, August 26. So what am I doing? I'm taking a top. I'm going to transport that to the future. And in doing that, I looked at the profile, the energetic profile. What something happened on August 26, energy-wise, that forced or enabled and created this top. If it happened in the past, history tends to repeat itself. I am looking for an underlying energetic cause. If I can identify the energetic cause, I'm then in a better position to, uh, when, I, um, when I know when it occurs again, that similar phenomena, I have a similar expectation for a similar phenomena, a top or a bottom to form. So it turned out this, the profile in energy, as the next slide will show, I believe, if, or in some slides down after this, occurred the next time I had a similar energy profile as to what occurred on August 26 was October 17. That becomes at least a prospective forecast or time point for this market. Here's the, okay, again, this is a circle. You don't have to be aware of the details of all this. For someone, this is an ephemeris wheel. Um, I can't teach in the space of the amount of time we have today all of this. Some of you are aware of what this is about. If you are, great. If you aren't, don't worry about it. Here's what I want to point out. Notice this highlighted, the, the thick red line here. It points out a 180 degree separation from this point to this point is one half of the circle. That remember, one half, or that is what's called, that's a, that's an important harmonic. We're subtracting. Uh, we're uh, breaking up the circle into two parts, 180 degrees apart, one from another. You see, and that's one of the, remember, uh, five important uh, fractional parts of a circle, if you recall. It turns out this little symbol here is, corresponds to a planetary body. This is for Venus, and over here, this is Uranus, Venus opposition Uranus, meaning that they are opposed, or 180 degrees. That happens to be particularly important for equities in the United States. There are some planetary combinations that are market specific. There are some planetary combinations that are not. They are generally applicable to all financial markets, be they a stock, a bond, a commodity, a currency, a treasury instrument, gold, silver, platinum, or Google, or Bank of America, or General Electric, or Microsoft. It doesn't matter. Depending on what, the, there are, there are sub-details and nuances of interpretation. However, 
beyond that, even if you're not aware of that, simply applying the simple rules. What is identify in your chart? A top like this, a bottom like this, a top like this. Identify the energetic picture or structure on that day. Whatever it was, it's similar to exert or it's more likely going to exert a similar impact at some point in the future when it reoccurs. Very simple concept procedurally. So I see on August 26, the year the date, this was an important relationship. It's an opposition between two uh, bodies. That means there is a there's a reinforcing of certain types of energy around the perimeter, excuse me, the circumference rather of that circle. That's on August 26. This was the next time I saw a similar 120 degree between the two planetary the same bodies. Aha, so that gives me the reason to expect that there is more likely going to be uh, a similar uh, phenomena occurring on or around October 20, October 17, excuse me. And that's what I'm, that's very simply. In order to do this, yes, you have to know how and when you can expect to see these certain angular relationships or aspects occurring between the planetary bodies. There are tools for that. Thirty some years ago, I would go to the library and look it up in what's called in, a, in, a, in, a, in written form, or I'd purchase at the bookstore a record of the planetary positions in an ephemeris, uh, and it would be good for a year, and then every year get a new one. In today's world, we have software for this, if you choose to do this approach. All right. Cycle progression. This is just another example, S&P. Uh, we had a, an important turning point of, you know, it's not as obvious, September 7th, and then it projected for me using the same set of ideas, October 12th, another turning point. Okay, this is September 7th. We had a geo, well, we had a, forget that for now, it's just another way of interpreting this. The sun was 60 degrees apart from Jupiter. Remember, that's what's called a sextile. That's another angular uh, separation within a circle uh, of importance that, cars, that has correlates in financial markets. When, the, when different bodies, the sun being a fast-moving body, is in uh, a certain angular or aspect relationship with a, a slower, the outer planet Jupiter, that ten, this, and here it is, this uh, uh, elongated or thicker red line indicates, this is the, um, where is it, this is the sun, this is, the, uh, this is the symbol for the sun, or the glyph for the sun, as they call it. This is the symbol for the planet Jupiter. Notice there's 60 degrees of separation. That's an important harmonic that tends to ramp up and reinforce energy around this circle. When it does, certain markets in particular respond to it uh, and fill up and reconcile or resonate with energy that resonation with energy enables that system to fill up beyond its filling point, creating a cessation of motion, allowing for an onset of a different type of motion, i.e. a trend reversal ensues. So if I see this, I know on September 7th we had this relationship, I, I might look for a similar angular relationship to occur between these two bodies. These, think of these as the pitcher and the catcher. When they, they're in a, one, this is a faster moving celestial body, this is a slower moving, because this is the, you can't get much uh, closer to the sun or to the center of the circle than the center itself with respect to an outer or slower moving body. That's the concept. When they are in a particular angular relationship, it tends to correlate with turning points, tops and bottoms. So if it happened in the past, when is the next time these two, the catcher and the pitcher, tend to be in an important harmonic relationship? If not, it doesn't have to be 60 degrees, it could be one of the other five that I mentioned. Well, let's see. Aha, that was back on September 7th of 2013. The next time I observe, October 12th. Okay, a little more than a month later, we had an interesting, we had another 90 degree relationship between the two bodies, the catcher or the, the pitcher and the catcher or whatever you want to look at it. And as such, that tells me red flag rays on, a, on or around October 12th. If it, if it formed an important pivot point back on September 7th, when I see a similar relationship again between those, the pitcher and the catcher, so to speak, uh, in the future, that lets me know, aha, greater than average probability for a similar top or bottom to form, you see? Very simple concept. The 90-year cycle. 
90 years, the square, 90 degrees of separation around a circle, part of the reason that uh, is is important has to if those of you who want to get in a little more into detail consideration of the 90 year cycle um, is usually a good starting point the relevancy of this particular amount of time elapsed stems from the first order recurrence or conjunction time between the planet Saturn and Uranus uh, those of some of you may be aware of the celestial mechanic uh, uh, properties I'm referring to in this slide. If you aren't, don't worry. Suffice it to say, this is just providing, if you if you are not, it happens, there's a 90-year cycle. In other words, it takes 90 years for Saturn, the planet Saturn and Uranus, to be in the same point on the circumference of the circle or their orbits around the sun. Uh, every 90 years, they tend to be at exact, roughly or exactly this, the same position together. That's what's called being conjunct or coming together, the Latin conjunction. Um, and that's why for that's that has a lot to do, if you believe this, I'm not trying to sell you on this idea uh, as a cause and effect concept as to some of the phenomena we see here on our on a ter, in a terrestrial sense on our planet Earth. Um, there are impacts cyclically due to this cycle. All right. Harmonics of 90, which I, is an alternate idea that ultimately comes from this. Harmonics are fractional parts and or multiples. So a fractional part of 90, one half of 90 is 45. 90 being the fundamental harmonic or principal amount of time elapse. Uh, and the importance of 90, again, is due to, in large part, what the preceding slide mentioned. It is the conjunction between those two, the time of return between Saturn and Uranus. Um, if you believe that, if you don't, understand or if you are not convinced of that let's observe numerical correlation between these amounts of time elapse and certain types of market behavior let the proof be in the pudding as they say you see let's just check are you guys okay let's just see okay just let me take a time out here just to respond. Planets in harmony for trading cosmic effect to convert into seasonality. Seasonality is another, uh, it's an aspect or an attribute, VJ, it is certainly, I agree totally, it is a component of timing. Markets tend, seasonality is in a, a, a simple, con, uh, con, uh, just synopsis of what seasonality is as it relates to market analysis is simply recognizing and observing, chronicling and keeping some statistical data on a tendency for a certain markets to do or move in certain ways at certain points in time, year in and year out. It's just a, another aspect of timing. If I know that, that year in and year out at the end of the summer, uh, heating oil markets or heating oil tends to rise because of whatever. I, if I know that, if I could, I might further know that the reason it rises, uh, it may not make sense initially because you might say, well, why would heating oil go up prices in the summer because temperatures tend to rise? Well, because it uh, is, is cheaper for uh, the retailers to lock in by through hedging mechanisms and that bids the price up at a time that might you might not otherwise think. But that's a phenomena based on real world events that tend to create a pattern. And we see this pattern year in and year out. That, as such, it, it's, it becomes embedded as a timing phenomena. So yes, certainly seasonality is an integral aspect of market timing. Yes, and it, and it ultimately it manifests, converts into seasonality and ultimately into the chart pattern. Certainly this is the case. At an even deeper level, the cyclical components, 45 periods of time, 90 periods of time, 180, 270, 360, are also, these are, notice, uh, some. these reflect some of the important harmonics that the preceding slides are alluding to. 90 is the square, this is the opposition, this is another, this is another form of the square, this is a conjunction. What you don't see here, I didn't list the trine, the 120, and the 60, the sextile, but th this is just a special case. Um, we all want, we, remember I said earlier, whether if any type of analysis, whether it's price related, you're trying to project a price target or a zone of, of resistance or support, um, and or you're trying to project and predict a time target. 
uh, always it, it's good policy analytically in terms of your analysis not to depend on a single technique. Any given technique may be effective X percent of the time. If you are utilizing a, a tool, as long to the extent you apply and use and depend on a particular tool that's not perfect, always it's uh, to shore up your research and improve your results and great and, and increase increase your confidence at, with reliability and ultimately the reliability of the the sum of all the tools. It's always good to shore up your your to one tool with alternate types of tools so that. The, you're, you're stacking the probabilities to your side of the ledger. 90 periods of time elapsed correlates with trend reversal, as do its harmonics, also multiples of 90 and fractional parts. So this is an, a very simple way. I will identify on a price chart uh, simply pivot points, tops and bottoms, or points that stick out, and will project out or run out by these five specific amounts of time elapse. You see? And the endings of those various projections or displacements often project for me uh, time targets. I will do this a number of times and I do it a multiple of times. I iterate the function, I repeat the process uh, because very often uh, if you happen to get uh, a number of time points that are the same, time targets that come up from that have arisen from different starting points, that tends to ramp up the uh, uh, reliability of, of the market responding to that mutually arrived at time point. So that's an, uh, a, a, uh, a more realistic application of this concept. But this is just another tool I use. I am not going into detail here, but it's simply a matter of identifying, similar to the protocol, you identify tops and bottoms that have happened in the past and run out by these five amounts of time elapsed. The end of those pro uh, a projections mark for you certain points in the future for which you can expect will have a greater than average probability to reverse or change an attribute of their behavior. Um, so that's an alternate form of analysis uh, that I apply. Okay, high energy top. This is um, May 19th. This is an important top on, this is referring to the stock market as the subsequent slide will show. May 19th, so uh, here's an example. This is, the, this is a graphic picture of what the energy was looking like from a celestial mechanical standpoint, let's say. I just, this is a, an ephemeris program that I use uh, to determine what the energy was at any given point in time. So if I looked at my the S&P chart, which I did on May 19th, and you'll clearly see, if you don't recall, there was a, 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 an important top on May 19th. Why did that occur? If it occurred on May 19th, and if there's some interesting energy configuration, chances are that well, when that energy configuration that was to a large extent, I may assume, responsible for creating this important price phenomena on May 19th, when that reoccurs, I can expect a similar phenomena, a top or a bottom to occur. So let's see. Here, and this one I forgot, I didn't, uh, I was having some problems last night when I put this together, but here's, I, I, here's the important relationship. See this little picture here? This is for the planet Venus, and I want you to see this kind of dark blue, this is Uranus, and there's a square, this line here, I should have, this would have been the highlighted thick red band. They are 90 degrees separation, that's a square. That correlates with that 90 year cycle. Saturn and Uranus, that's the conjunction, that's why this works, folks, by the way. Or if not, just think of it, this is the 90 degree, this is as if uh, I am reinforcing the energy as it bounces around. This, if, if I were sitting here at this point where this planet is in its orbit and I threw a baseball or a projectile to this point, it would angle of incidence equals angle of reflection. It would go, some of that energy would be reflected directly back, some of the energy will be reflected at exactly the angle over here, and then it will bounce off of here, and it will bounce here creating a square. That's why it's called a square. That's the geometric structure that it creates. They, for sake of uh, of making this diagram because there's so many uh, relationships uh, that are harmonic that are overlaid one on top of the other. It would be too busy to draw all of the uh, complete structures. So they just draw uh, the, the single to indicate the specific angular harmonic that's at play. Okay, so this is a, an important pattern that occurred on May 19th. 
it's one, there are many, but that's one that I want to focus on right now. This between this, where this is located right here, and notice it's 90 degrees apart. Each one of these separations is 30 degrees. There are 24 uh, of these, or actually there are 12 30 degrees. If you, bro uh, if you broke it up into 15, there are 24. And that's an important, that's why 15 and, uh, is an important, uh, and the number 24 and 12 are important in not only market analysis, but in our in in various realms in our universe and in our world. The, think of the number of hours in, in, in a day, 24, the number of hours of daylight versus the number of hours of darkness. Uh, 12 and 24 are harmonics that ultimately have to come from this square relationship and harmonics of a circle. But, so this is on May 19th, you had an important uh, fast planet one closer to the center of the circle, that is Venus right here indicated by this symbol, and a slower more outer planet uh, in an important angular or harmonic aspect or relationship or angle, 90 degrees. Well, let's move on. This is the next time that that occurs or will occur, June 28th. Okay, so I'm going to make a bold pronouncement. I expect a reversal to occur on or about June 28th. What's today's date? June 13th. What's June 28th? Well, it happens to be the final Sunday in this month. Whenever a market's not trading, well, it actually, today, it, it has a partial, it's a, a, it, it opens up. But really, so you think the next major session would be the next day, the following. Markets don't know anything about the fact that for various regulatory reasons or embedded patterns of, of life and society, we, we shut down on the weekends. Markets just flow forward through time. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. You've worked out a time target. You work, and so whenever, by the way, as a practical consequence, a nuance of doing this in the real world, whenever I project a time point that happens to land on, say, a date that, let's say, the market, for whatever reason, is not trading, a, ho a holiday, weekend, etc., you look at the surrounding dates as the most probable uh, next opportunity for the market to reverse and obvious. That's a common sense concept. Um, and you look at all of the other factors that would support or not or be contraindications to that. So this is a very simple. Am I going to place a trade uh, immediately on June 28th or the, or the June 29th in this market solely based on this? Certainly not. You could to the extent you have confidence in this and similar relationships, but you could. This is just the data. My point is this, if nothing, if you don't, anything less than that simply would warrant a closer look at the markets with an expectation, an anticipation for a change to occur. And to the extent I accumulate and become aware and interpret a supporting uh, informational cast that would, I am essentially constructing and strengthening my argument for a certain view for that market. That's all this does. But that's saying a lot. I am now armed with more information than simply the price analyst is. I have complementary time. Gan said, as well as others, Jensen, Wyckoff, J.P. Morgan, uh, people today who follow and do this type of analysis, uh, clearly have a distinct advantage than if I, you know, if I don't have any idea in the final week of this month leading into the first week of July for a change in the, in the stock market, I may be more readily, easily, more readily or easily caught off guard. On the one hand, on the other hand, if I know going into the final week of June, the first week of July, to expect something of importance concerning equity motion and, and what's going to happen in the stock market, I am more attuned to the news if I take into account fundamental events. I, if I'm a technician, I'm going to be focused on my indicators that for me, uh, uh, I tend to feel comfortable utilizing. If nothing else, that's at minimum, but at maximum, it can do so much more simply based on an awareness of a projected time point. Let's see, I see someone wrote in a statement, can I give target level of S&P? Now, the answer is yes, uh, VJ, that, but understand that is a completely different form of analysis. Whenever a, you say a target, you're, I believe you're implying or inferencing a price. So yeah, I'm not saying do your timing to the exclusion of your price analysis, they are kind of the best of all worlds you have when price and time collide is what Gann called the squaring of time and price. However, 
even if I couldn't? My answer is, yeah, I have price targets worked out. The price analysis for me and for most traders, because we folk, we start there typically, and most of us spend, uh, look at price to the exclusion of time, tends to be a lot easier. There's a lot of people, as I said, 80% of all the table of contents in, in technical analysis books, you look at Murphy's book, Schrager's book, McGee and Edwards, you go back to the granddaddy of them all, most analysis, most indicators, most of the researcher and research and forms and tools and indicators and tools and relationships and models that we use are for the purpose of, of figuring out what price a market's going to find or run into resistance above or below support. We've got pivot point analysis. You, have, you can name it. There's no end to the forms and types of models that are applied and can be used to enable us to project price targets. I am not against that. I am all for that. That's where I started. But this is, I, this is if I have a price and time, wouldn't it be curious to see I do a Fibonacci projection or I do a gap uh, multiple or I do a harmonic projection, I get a price target. Wouldn't it be curious to see if my price target is achieved at the time that I projected a time a market to turn? I have both. That would serve to ramp up and increase the probability that I have accurately interpreted this. I have a better... Uh, correlation. I have increased my potential edge for launching a, uh, a pro what would ultimately be a profitable campaign in the market or position in play. That's all. All right. All right, moving on. Let's see here. This is, all right, so this is a slide. This is uh, yesterday's chart of the S&P uh, that I want to show here. And this is a daily chart. These are some, not all. I just wanted, for clarity's sake, this is a previous time target that I projected theoretically. I projected May 25. That was Memorial Day, if I recall. So again, remember, whenever you project in, as a matter of practical course here, whenever you project a time point that happens to come in at a point in time when the market's not trading, a holiday, weekend, etc., look at the surrounding next opportunity, the, the days surrounding that projected time point. It turns out in retrospect, I think, piecing this together, you know, we know we work with the information we have at it as best we can, given at any point in time, we had an obvious top on May 19th. That was the preceding week. Memorial Day was a Monday. Look at that top, May 19th. The actual pivot point, May in, in after the fact, I realized May 19th was the top. So my time target in this example, sometimes I'm deadly precise. Other times there's degrees of accuracy. It won't be as accurate. It's plus or minus a margin of except, a window of time. Nevertheless, it doesn't hurt. It typically will help because we have to allow, you know, I don't know the future with absolute certainty. Barring that, we utilize as much information as we can to project plausible scenarios in, as stated in both terms of time and price. That's all. So my the I had projected this months, if weeks, if not months in advance of a rising. And as we got here, after we saw the market hit the top the preceding week on the 19th, I realized aha, one of two things. Either this pertains to a different turning point, or it was pertaining to the preceding top that had formed the week before on the 19th of May, and my projection was late. I think now it was late. It happens sometimes, not all the time, but some. In, sometimes I'm, I'm more precise, other times it's less less precise. Um, but in this case, I, it's the past. It's no longer of immediate relevancy from a practical trading standpoint. My next projected time target of significance for the stock market, this is the S&P, June 29th. It happens to be the end of this month. So I be, it, if nothing else, it enables me to project and start to think in terms of plausible types of motion. If someone asks me, Glenn, or am I bullish or bearish, the stocks and, or the stock market, I might assume all the, as a starting assumption, what is the market, uh, when was the last time it had a turning point? May 19th. And when is the next time it has a turning point? June 29th. If on an initial assumption, and granted, this is the starting point and is purposely, or not purposely, but it is recognizably very, very simplistic because it doesn't take into account the possibility of interim turning points like we have here, by the way, uh, that may be may occur and to which the market will revolve or flip or rotate its rotation of trend 
but if it may not be picked up by my analysis. It may be impervious to my theoretical analytical time net. I didn't pick it up. Makes it I, so I have to allow for that. Doesn't take away from the relevancy relevancy of any projected time target I do derive and I'm aware of. It just I am cognizant of the idea. However thorough and comprehensive my analytical time projection methodology is, it may not be perfect. It may not be completely comprehensive and capture every turning point. So I have to take that into account. But assuming that I it is perfect as a starting point. I might assume all things be all other variables or x factors xed out and isolated and fixed, as they say. I can assume assume more or less the trend between one turning point and the next turning point for which I have reliability, the market to persist on a given direction. So, in general, I've been telling people for the last couple of weeks, I expect the S and P or the stock market to drift lower move down into the next point in time in which I expect its energy to be filled up to the point of breaking the break level where I expect a turn to occur. Now, so far you can see the net trend from the previous turning point of significance, the top up here on May 19th through where we are yesterday's close, this, this last bar on the chart is down. Albeit we've had, it's not a straight line, it's back and forth, back and forth, but if I, at least it gives me some semblance of overall macro view, June 29th. If it continues as we get closer and closer, more and more proximal to my stated projected time target, I might begin more and more closely to have greater and greater degrees of confidence that this June 29th time point would correspond to a bottom. If on the other, and as such, I'll be gearing up to consider bullish strategies, looking to practically trade the reversal. On the one hand, on the other hand, if between now and June 29th, if we start to see the market as it, as it at the point of landing, at the touchdown point in time on June 29th, if the arrival trajectory is higher, if the trend is moving up, I would alternatively look to exploit and go short. That simple. You play with the information you have or play the cards we're dealt and we play to win analytically and informationally. I've already, okay, so whatever happens will happen. We'll see for certainty once we have passed this time target. All I can say for now is I have uh, more than, you know, about 90% confidence change will occur on or around June 29th. The type of change, that is to say, whether from a price perspective it will manifest as a top or a bottom, will be more a function of the direction of trend as it at the point of touchdown on June 29th. After that occurs, I've already projected out the sub, a, a next major uh, turning point in time subsequent to June 29th, all the way out in August. That's not to say the market's going to go straight up or down between June 29th and August 19th. It might, probably not, but it, it might not. Uh, but all I do know, what the information tells me, I'm not, I'm not, con I am very concerned about what I don't know, but I also, I can't, I can't, allow that to stymie me from a practical standpoint, I recognize and utilize as best I can trying to create as complete a picture with the information I do know. I do know that this is another time target for which I have high degree of confidence, August 19, after we've approached June 29th. So this is not as immediately practical of importance, but it will be as I get into the middle of August for the stock market. All right, practical. Bond market. This is a, if I'm doing the analysis. These are I haven't listed all the time targets that I projected historically or even uh, further, but just a, the most immediate one. It happens coincidentally or otherwise. Not probably so. Not so much because there's an intimate intermarket correlation between interest rates, bonds, treasury bonds, and stocks, obviously, and and the stocks. May 12th was one. This was uh, there. Uh, this was an obvious pivot point here. I don't know. This was the top in the bond market. This is an obvious pivot point here. These points in time would be interest. this point, this top, this bottom, this top, this bottom right here, all important points that the previous slides would have alluded to and would be uh, uh, viable candidate pivots from which to check a look at the circular angular harmonics and see what was going on on this day, at the date when the market formed that obvious pivot. What was going on in this bottom on that day when it formed the obvious bottom. What was going on energetically? And progress those energetic 
configurations, the planetary con uh, harmonic relationships, if there were important ones between the slower moving celestial bodies and the faster moving bodies that corresponded with any of these important pivots. If there were, find out and just there are ways you can find out when the next time they will be repeating and they will indicate to you in the future when you can expect similar uh, tops or bottoms to form. So from a practical standpoint, and I have just, just for the record, I've been short in the bonds. I'm short on average. We liquidated some of our short position. We got short at 157 and change right over here. So it's roughly around in this area here where we're short just for those of you who want a little more practical stuff. Um, I am expecting the market to can move lower. I'm still bearish the bond market, even though overall we can see in the last couple of sessions uh, it moved up. But overall you can see from this top, depending on your window of time, you have to put into context your view, then your directional forecast and so forth. But overall, I have a time target for interest rates or the treasury bond in particular, the next coming in at the end of the month, similar to the stock market. That's not probably all that coincidental, again, due to the inner correlation, intermarket correlation between the two sectors, bonds and equities. All right. For those of you who track oil, this is a this is a, a printed out last yesterday after the close. Uh, these are some dates that some past turning points. I didn't mark all of the dates, but you can see this came in a day or two before a bottom. This actually was perfect. I purposely put the vertical line one day to the um, to the left. Uh, but we projected exactly to that bottom just so you could see the bottom there. That's why I did it. it was March 18th. That was a bottom that we projected weeks, if not months, in advance of that occurring by some of by the methods that we're using and talking about right now. This was a <clears throat> this was another turning point. It doesn't. It was important uh, in ways that are not so obvious. But I didn't mark it because I know it's not obviously apparent. It's not a pivot point bottom or top. It's a consolidation period there. June 1st was very important to me. Uh, and those of people who have heard me talk in the last few months about oil and the, and the programs I've done, June 1st, I believe was, a, if I recall, was a Monday. That Friday was the 5th, the OPEC meeting. So I knew to expect significant motion, as we can see here, back and forth. The market is still a little schizophrenic, as you see, trying to figure out. I am still bearish oil. And my next time target for oil, crude oil in particular, this is the July futures contract of WTI crude oil, is July 14th. So what does that tell me? If I'm fashioning, beginning to fashion some type of uh, viewpoint or forecast for energy or oil in particular, I am bearish oil and, I, and someone could ask me particulars. Um, depending on, uh, I, I would combine this with my wave count. You know, I can see some one, two, three, this might be a four or here, or this might be, you know, the end of the four and we're going to go up into the fifth. That would be a contra indication depending on one's wave count. I haven't said anything about that, but allowing the vertical uh, distribution of time points to more or less act as your guide or tour guide through time, I then combine that and look for agreeing alignments between things like Elliott Wave, if that's what the tool for price that you use. It's a descriptive model or whatever you utilize. It could be seasonality. It could be candle form analysis. Um, this is admittedly a daily chart. This would not be of as this would be of less interest to a shorter term trader, I will apply the same thing on an intraday basis and can do the same thing for oil or any other market, same concept. The only difference is instead of calibrating and marking in terms of days, I'll do everything in terms of hours or minutes that make sense on a shorter time window. That's all. Okay. Soybean, for those of you who are in the agricultural field, farmers, hedging, uh, speculative uh, derivatives in, in ags or in uh, beans, for example, these are some past time targets that I projected. This is the next one I've coming up, June 16th. That happens to be this week. So I got long in bon uh, beans earlier this week. Um, I can see I'm, uh, possibly I'm either going to get out based, that's a separate issue, but here's my issue. What is the market doing and what is will, will it be doing at the time of touchdown on this point in time as it meets this point in time? Right now, this is as of yesterday's close, this is going down. So I might expect, notice that if it's curious, I might have a convergence here 
or a reconciliation or a dovetailing between or what Gann would refer to and people like Gann as a squaring of time and price. Curious, we've got a little, I can see it's not all that inconceivable that the market might not form a little double bottom here, in which case double bottoms correlate with trend reversal, a bounce to the upside. I don't know. I don't, I don't not know. I'm just saying I, this is my next time target for which I have confidence in the soybean market, which is coming up this Tuesday. So whatever type of price action is in motion as it arrives on Tuesday, June 16th, I would expect there is a greater than average probability or correlation for that type of motion to cease, allowing for a commensurate onset of an alternate type of motion, i.e. a trend reversal is more likely to occur. That's all it tells me. But that can be a lot. I might then check and see, do I have divergence from my oscillators? Do I have a candle formation? Do I have wave counts that would be in alignment and also suggestive of a trend reversal? Do I have fundamental pieces of information? What's the USDA crop report? What, what is the weather? Any and all other information that would be aligned will serve to strengthen my correlation and my edge. That's all. Here's an intraday example. This is an hourly chart I printed out last night. This is yesterday's activity in the S&P, the E-mini, the June contract. Um, this is an alternate type of technique that I use. A lot of these techniques stem from the planetary harmonics and the energetics of a circle, but it's a, an extension of such, a, a variation on a theme, if you will. This period, I took a top and a bottom. Visual inspection of a, this is an hourly chart of the E-mini, June E-mini contract, S&P, hour by hour day trading activity, timing as example utilized for a, a day trader. 524, top, market form to top. Little double bottom here at 644. That's an 80 minute interval. Through SART, I, I worked out some harmonics of 80 minutes using certain Fibonacci ratios. And I projected for the court, for the session yesterday, uh, time targets, four in this case. This is an oversimplification uh, but it nevertheless conveys the thrust of the concept as I what that I would do and what that I actually do in day trading. In this case, it's the E mini S and P. This is a time target. Everywhere you have a vertical bar represents a point in time for which I expected the market to reverse. Um, would I place a trade, go long or short solely in contracts and buy lots or positions and spoos or or no? I don't know. Not necessarily, but if I have other reasons from a price standpoint, if I have a price pattern or a trigger or a, a, a catalyst, I will be, I would recognize especially the greater uh, than likely coincidence that it's just coincidence and I uh, have more information. So this is the hourly chart. Again, I took a time period. It's a form of time period analysis, 80 minutes. And by breaking up 80 minutes into certain important harmonics, I got four specific points in the session yesterday that told me in advance, I could, you could have done this at any point after 644, okay? And I knew in advance when to expect these points. So now, you can see this was pretty close. This was not as close. This was, well, that's not a hit. But we probably had two out of four there. Let me show you a little more resolution. This is a one-minute chart, same situation where the times are that I projected theoretically are marked. 7.33, you could see it was probably off by two minutes there. It was a bottom. By the way, I'm not making any, the analysis doesn't intrinsically by in and of itself make claims as to the tradability. That is the sustain it, sustenance and durability or uh, persistence of the move that occurs if and in fact the market does reverse. All this does is tell you points in time as the market forward flows forward in its evolution for where it's more likely going to shift its course. If at those times when you get there, you have other factors, i.e. from the price, your price toolbox that would be uh, confirming, you essentially have more information by which to make a more objective, higher bet trade. That's all. 7.33, you can see gain two minutes prior in the market reversed. 8.36 very close to the top there. And that was that was probably the one of the better, uh, you had a tradable fall there, you know, depending if you had seen it, you have to pay attention. Um, now here, I just thought I'd just play with you a little bit. Uh, in a bigger sense, I wanna show you something. Notice a wave count that you could do here, if, you, uh, if we can see this. This might be, this is like a start of a one. This would be one, for those of you who understand Elliott, this would be correction two, this might be a three, and then you have a triangle, four. 
as triangles typically, one A, B, C, D, maybe E. You can see if you drew a trend line, the descending series of tops and kind of flat, or maybe a, a kind of, or slightly rising for triangular fourth wave. And this is the hourly chart back down to the higher resolution, more granularity single uh, second or minute chart. And you have the uh, marked off time points that I projected using a, a, a specific type of analysis, 7.33 in the morning, 8.36, 10.18, 12.27 in the afternoon. And notice this 10.18 time point captured, I, you can see within that move up, from this bottom to this top, I can clearly see from an, a wave standpoint, wave one, two, that's an obvious three, notice a little consolidation four, and your fifth. Notice that this time target, if you saw it as such, and I realize, folks, in the midst of it is harder, but those of you who are adept at day trading in particular, or any time frame, the same concept will apply. I'm, this is just a, me breaking down for the sake of it, showing how recognition and, and a cogni being cognizant of the idea that the market may change on or around 10.18 in the morning, seeing the structure, if I recognize this to be a fourth wave, one of the things that Eliotitians struggle with and spend inordinate amounts of time uh, trying to figure out is when, in fact, a fourth wave is over, so as to get on board a fifth wave with some confidence. You know, oftentimes one of the things that plagues traders about fourth waves is they think it's over and it's not. This would have been a piece of information that might have cued me and clued me a little more firmly that the idea that maybe the fourth had ended and there was the onset of the fifth wave. So that might have been a tradable move, or at least a portion of such, on an intraday minute chart in the S&P yesterday's action. That's all. And then later in the day, uh, you had very close to the bottom, if not at the bottom. S&P, this is a complete, this is an old slide. This is back a year ago. This is an, another a completely different application of the circle technique. Imagine this thrust from this bottom to this top being the radius of a circle. I didn't draw the circle, but this is the center point of a circle. And if you have that circle come down, it enabled me to project to the day of what in retrospect turned out to be a, an important bottom to the day. I did this at eight months in advance. Well, actually more about a month in advance, actually more, a little month and a half in advance. Uh, the moment I observed this using an ancillary technique of projecting time, um, I was able to come up the actual, the theoretical projection. This is a series of forecasts I made using the techniques that I'm referring to today in the S in the stock market and the actual uh, the theoretical was 1015 it actually came in to the day 1015 we see that chart there this is an actual application just ex uh, running this radius extending it and the end of that the point on the circle that would be tangent to the due east or the three o'clock position on that circle worked out and that's how I did that or how the technique did that and then you can see these are just a history of some of the subsequent time targets that we projected. Again, this says nothing about price, everything about time. At the time I did this projection for October 15 last year, I didn't know if it was going to be a top or a bottom. Again, I did that somewhere up in here. It might have been a top or a bottom. Again, I could re I started to make reasonable assumptions as you see what the market's doing as it gets closer and closer to the projected time target. It's that simple. Conjunction power. This is, uh, for those of you who are, um, let me just see here, are any questions so far? Uh, intersection, there are quite a number of questions. Let's see. Geometric harmonic. Okay, that, that was the last question. Can I give, yeah, I'll come back to that. Can, I, can growth ratios, arithmetic, geometric harmonic progression be applied to time? Certainly yes, um, for the person who asked that. There's a broader concept that people like Gann and Jensen, uh, people today, uh, Larry Pezzavento, uh, Michael Jenkins, um, Jim Flanagan, uh, uh, who else? Um, um, Robert Miner, uh, Robert Krauss, people who ascribe to time ideas that I do in particular. Uh, Jeannie Long, for example, did, does a lot of GAN and astrocycle analysis in particular. Um, I'm not the only one, certainly, but 
and the people that I just mentioned are I consider, you know, if in spirit, because some of them, Gan, you know, he had passed on before I was even got involved in this, but um, certainly some of the people that, I, all of the people that I just mentioned, I consider to have learned from either directly or, or indirectly through their, uh, the legacy of their results and their material that they produced in books and learning material over the years. But um, the quick answer is yes, but the point I wanted to mention is this. And it's a deeper concept that people like Gann uh, disclose, and that is the equivalency of price and time. Whatever you do to time, you should be, or price, you should be doing to time, and vice versa. If I'm doing Fibonacci analysis on to, to work out and project a price target and generate zones of support or probable degrees of retracement or project a target, I ought to be doing that for time. They are one in, they are, two different sides of, an, of the similar and the same underlying energetic phenomena. When I look at a price chart, essentially I'm looking at a graphic picture of energy flow. Every time a top or a bottom comes in, as I alluded to at the beginning of the presentation, I'm simply observing a point where the system, similar to that bridge, I think it was, it was in Tacoma, Washington, many years ago. I remember in junior high school in, in a, seeing a little video of a bridge that began shake, uh, waving in the air because the wind velocity got so high and it was moving, it, the wind was at a particular frequency that happened to resonate with the structural componentry of that structure, that bridge. And it took on, it started resonating in sync with the uh, the the um, the wave length of whatever external forces. In this case, it was the the wind, uh, the winds, uh, the weather system, and it contained it. It resonated so highly, it collapsed. The system, the bridge, broke or or fell apart. That had catastrophic con consequences. This is the same energy phenomena that occurs when a top or a bottom occurs in a financial market. Okay, next question. When two trend lines are drawn properly, the intersection gives the target, which can be a plus or minus number or range if one uses the hard numbers in analysis. The accuracy can be more precise. Am I making the right statement? The answer is yes, you are. And most traders look at, and, and I don't want to give short attention to that. That's an important observation. Most traders, myself included initially, used to think of that solely as a price phenomenon. The reason you, we typically create an intersection of trend lines where we, where we do, the point of intersection is more likely to correspond with a trend reversal if a certain amount of time has elapsed from, let's say, the onset of a particular trend as graphically illustrated or con contained or demarcated with a particular trend line. Trend line analysis works to a large extent when it does. Uh, you know, part of the reason it doesn't work is because it's ubiquitous. Part of the reason, curiously enough, trend line analysis works because it's one of the oldest form of analysis. It's been around for 200 years. Works is because it's it's general. It's not arithmetically precise. It's not binary, and its imprecision, curiously enough, is part of the reason why trend lines work as well as they do. Because if it were more precise it would have been discounted by the market. But that's the, but to your point, I am suggesting another reason why trend lines work, or the intersection of trend lines work when they do, as well as they do, is having to do with certain, they are cordoning off, or they are specifying certain amounts of elapsed time. Uh, a general, concise, concise wrap up, or synopsis of a lot of what Gann was saying is, a market will do, and I'm paraphrasing what Gann said, a market will do what it's going to do only once its time has come, when its amounted time has run out. Very often we see that specified time amounts or periods correlate with harmonics of the circle, the energy. The time runs out because the system has been filled up to the point where it cannot hold in its current structure and configuration any more energy. If it can't hold any more energy, it's it 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 the energy will overflow, and it whole and it allowing for a different regime of market behavior to ensue. We call it tops and bottoms, but the broader classification and understanding and description is a consequence of an energy flux and dynamic. 
and an extreme in particular. When the energy, when the system fills up to its capacity and cannot exceed any additional energy. And this allows me to uh, segue into this slide. This is, an, this is a different a conjunction, well, it's a conjunction power. A conjunction is when two things come together. I alluded to it in the previous slides. Imagine these are two, uh, this is a pin of rotation, and these are two diameters or radii. One, let's fix one of the lengths, one of the lines, keep it stationary, and let's say line number two rotates. It just revolves around the center of this region. Let's say this region here is region of positive charge. Po positive polarity, the indication or the, the places indicated with negative signs are regions of negative polarity. We know by, def by definition, charges, opposite charges repel each other. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, like charges repel, opposite charges attract. Polarity. There is an attraction between opposite charges in, in the electrical world, as in many, and there are other manifestations of that too, but in terms of electrical charge, opposite charges attract, like charges repel. That's a necessary uh, principle we must be aware of to understand the energetics of a lot of phenomena in our world, in our universe, and in financial markets. Everything in our universe, and every other, for that matter, that I'm aware of, is, to a large extent, is an energy-related phenomena, if not directly, indirectly. Okay, so if we allow this vector, this line labeled number two, to spin on its axis, let's say there's a pin, hypothetically, to illustrate how this works, as it does so, this region of positive charge gets smaller and smaller. It's almost, it's another way of saying that we're filling up this finite region with added charge, added charge of the same polarity, all positive. Or another way to increase its, uh, uh, the amount is to decrease the space. Well, if like charges repel, there's going to be less and less space for them. They're going to be more and more crowded. And as they get closer and closer, the frequency of repulsion increases, curiously enough. Okay, I, I see. I'm just. I want to get to the questions, but I want to get through the slideshow, and I'll come back at the end in a few seconds, in a few minutes, like within five minutes here, folks, to address the questions and any others that you have. Okay, but let me quickly wrap up. All right, like as the region narrows, and in the limit there was no space. That charge. Where where does something go if there's no place to go? Well, there's only. You know, I had a professor one time, many years ago, that said when you have considered all the possible and you don't reach any conclusion or conclusions that make any sense whatsoever consider the impossible one of them that's however simple that may sound on the surface one of the most helpful things in my life and i dare say it's you know it is what when people say think out of the box well we need that in our market analysis in general uh that concept I, although it hasn't given me necessarily great breakthroughs and profound insights, it has helped me in understanding certain things and certain aspects of markets. But in any case, here's the progression of, it's hard, you know, in, 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 in a static picture to illustrate, but assuming on a continuum of motion that this line, uh, this radius or this diameter, the spoke of a wheel, if you would, rotated around its axis, at some point, it will end up in this picture down here. It rotates through. Well, at the point where it is exactly conjunct or overlaid or superimposed, the two spokes are one on top of the other, there is zero room, zero space for this positive charge to go. So there is a, it squirts to the other side. There's a complete flip-flop or rotation of polarity. What was previously a region of solely positive charge becomes a region of negative charge. This is the importance of a particular harmonic where there is zero degrees of separation in that circle. This is, has a special effect. Conjunctions act as catalyst and triggers for a lot of market moves. So when I see a planetary configuration, small planet or faster planet to slower planet, and they ex happen to be conjunct or in uh, positions in their respective orbits, let's just say, such that there is no distance in terms of longitude. They are exactly at the same longitude in their rotations around the center point. That would be our star, the sun. That happens to be a particularly powerful 
it serves often as a trigger for certain market moves. Whether you understand the cause and effect step-by-step -step domino aspect of that, or even if you don't, you can still monitor and do statistics and collate and, and understand the, core, the numerical correlation of, of pattern and exploit that. And that, this is a, I wanted to make a special case for this conjunction because it's especially a powerful phenomena that we often see in markets. When I see uh, that there will be a conjunction between certain types of celestial bodies, I recognize, aha, that might serve as a particularly powerful day. It may manifest as a day of volatility in the market greater than typically uh, seen. This is another type of behavior and it's why, it's no coincidence why uh, the Elliott wave model, the logarithmic spiral, uh, why we uh, cordon off our day act, daily activity in units of 24 um, hours and half of that is 12 and why I use a four minute chart. It takes four, approximately four minutes for the Earth to rotate one degree on its axis every day and I have, I, I ma I'm able to manifest quite frequently a number of price patterns that are that are quite clarified on intraday charts for my short-term trading that's why I use a four-minute chart somebody people ask me well Glenn can I use a five-minute chart the you know it depends on the degree of accuracy you're trying to seek and and need but here's an important point in the related to the previous picture where does this energy go it squirts to the other side when there's no place for it to go when there's absolutely zero space in the in the limit Theoretically, you reach an infinite current. It's got to go somewhere, so when you have considered all the possibilities and there's no logical conclusion, consider the impossible. If you have an infinite amount of frequency because there's no space for the, uh, the bouncing back and forth, remember the earlier slide where, I, where the initial slide said, the information on the following slide is true, and then you go to the following slide. You follow through with that line, with that information, and you follow its directive, it tells you go to the next slide and interpret what it says to be true. When you arrive at that destination, its message is the information on the preceding slide is false. It forces you to bounce back. It sets up a wave of, of vibration. Well, when similar, I'm adding to this, when we have a boundary, imagine this: these radii or spokes of a wheel, this is the center point. If you have energy, and as it's squirting is this let's say one of these vectors one of these lines starts dynamically moving as the arrow indicates and it's approaching one of let's say the horizontal that energy that's contained here if it if once there becomes once you x out all the space it's going to leak out to the boundary of the system and the energy will tend to be resonating at a wavelength equal to the radius. This is getting into a little more detail of the structural, this is just the mechanics of energy in a circle. Well, the energy will, its, its wavelength will be equal to the radius of the circle, and it will go in either direction around the circumference of the circle. I just marked the arrow in one direction. It will be go equally at this way as well. And it turns out, as it does so, one, as it's traveled three wavelengths, again, each the wavelength of the energy as it gets to the end of the circle, because if it's squeezed, it's got to go somewhere. And ultimately, it will end, make its way to the periphery of that system that's containing it. And as it makes its way out to the boundary of the, of the system, that is the circumference of the circle, it will go in each direction. Once it has traveled three wavelengths, that will tend to be 15, approximately 15 degrees away from this, the point of conjunction, the point where this line was perfectly superimposed on this point, where there, you X'd out, there was became zero space, and the energy had to squirt to the per, get out of the system. It had to break down, because it it was, there was nowhere for it to go. Curiously enough, if it arrives after three wavelengths around the circle, it ends up at 15 degrees away from where this phenomena, this event occurred where the explosion or the destruction of the system that contained the energy to begin with occurred. Which is curiously, if you, you know, one half of the circumference of a circle is known, uh, the distance is 3.14. What's that number? Remember high, junior high or high school math? That's pi, 3.14. Remember? Half, that's, that's the distance for half of this the circumference. 
and it turns out the energy after having traveled three wavelengths or three radii will have traveled 15 degrees away from that. The difference is it, it gets, it's, it's off by 0.14. So if what fraction of that, if I take, the, in other words, 15 degrees away, it's, one, it's 0.14 away from the complete half of the circumference of the circle. So that turns to be, a, that, what's the difference? It's 0 0.044. So that percentage of a circle, as I do the arithmetic here, is 15.8, roughly 16 degrees. Well, 16 degrees doesn't divide evenly into 360, but the closest even uh, fractional portion of a 360 degree circle is 15. And so 15 degree, you have 24 15 units around a circle. This is why the 24th harmonic is such an important phenomena in so many features in our world around us and in more financial markets. And it's harmonics, one half, harmonics being especially fractional parts and multiples. One half of 24, one half of it, which is six, which is the sextile, if you recall, harmonic. It's just the word we use to describe the sixth harmonic of a circle or breaking up a, a 360 degree circle into six even parts or 60 degrees, six times six being 360, okay? Or six times 60, excuse me, and one half of that. Thus, the importance of triangles, okay, or stars, you know, overlaid the, the think of the Israeli flag, and curiously enough, if you think about it, and the, the houses of the zodiac, if you are so inclined, or the hours of the day, if that's your perspective, or the, a number of apostles, if that's your perspective, I submit these are not coincidence, or the number of months in a calendar year, or the 24th harmonic, the fact that so many systems that are dynamic in life, flowers, growth systems, um, uh, 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 growth in uh, a large part uh, often is, you know, the hexagonal spiral um, uh, is often found in so many aspects of nature. It's not, it ought not be therefore surprising that we find these patterns based on these energetic underlying phenomena in financial markets. Markets are, aren't markets just manifestations of uh, early, worldly activity at a larger level. These are fractal, smaller representations when we look at a, when I look at the stock market or an individual stock or dollar yen on a, as a spot pair of currency on any time frame, ever onward and outward as people like Gann would say. This is just a, uh, these are, this pertains to the stock uh, market. I focus on the S&P. Geometrically speaking, whether it's the S&P, the Russell, the Dow, the NASDAQ, SPY, etc., more or less, there are divergences in different, you know, I'm not suggesting that all indices of, in the United States or equity indices are perfectly uh, replica, certainly not, but more or less the geometric properties and the harmonics from an energetic standpoint are quite similar. Uh, I didn't update this because uh, I was rushed last night, but this is the most relevant for the future. My next time target, as I mentioned in a previous slide, was June 28. So I don't know exactly at the moment how that will manifest. What I do know, and, I, and in this particular case, and I'm oversimplifying, I just pointed out one mechanism and model that I utilize to generate time targets. Remember, the, car, the greater uh, rule of all analysis is don't depend on a single methodology or model. So I have, suffice it to say, a number of different models and relationships that I'm counting on and have utilized to generate, uh, and they're all happening in spite of happening in spite of their differences to come up with uh, this time point around June 28 this year. That's the end of this month, for which I expect a change in the stock market. And if you press, you know, if you ask me now, I can, I'll tell you what I think it will be, but I don't, I will more, the more close we, we arrive, well, the closer we get to this date, based on the trend componentry, I'll get a, a clearer tense sense and picture as to what I can expect. And it's at least a beginning as to how I can formulate my uh, projections, my views, and my practical strategies for locating good trades. Let me now, I have some time left, folks, so let me now try and, uh, respond to the questions that we see. How often is this astrology-based timing successful for trading the markets? Good question. I assume that I have uh, 
documented the percentage of time this works. Are there markets for which this does not work? Well, let me, the latter part of your question, let me respond to that first. There may be, but I'm not aware of them. Most of the most freely traded markets, again, given the paradigm that I'm presenting of, in a very general, very deep sense, again, my uh, paradigm is that all markets uh, uh, do what they do price-wise because they have achieved and have run uh, in terms of certain types of price behavior. And if you think about it in a general sense, there are only three major types of market motion uh, occurring on a, on a flat surface. Uh, as observed on a plane, on a two-dimensional plot of price as a function of time, up, down, or sideways. But broadening that paradigm, when I look at that, that's just a picture again of energy. When the market is trending up, down, or sideways, is sideways, it is doing so because it is, because it is it is that's its lowest energy state. And the lowest energy state, that is the state that, that requires the least amount of energy for per sustenance and persistency, ensures more greatly the survival of that system. In this case, it's a very complicated dyna dynamic system. We call it a financial market, and we've worked out very sophisticated and clever concepts and ideas and tricks by which to exploit its motion for profit. Nevertheless, it still adheres to and is informed by and is directed by energy. And when you see a top or a bottom, a turning point, a pivot, whatever you choose to think of it as and define it as and what terms you place it in, it represents a point where the system, similar to by analogy to that bridge in, I think it was Tacoma, Washington, that has resonated so perfectly with the forces external to it, the resonation has allowed enough, so much energy to come in, it breaks out beyond its bonds. It has to go somewhere, as in the last few slides indicated. If you fill up a container past its filling point, if there is an, a, a, a portal of escape, it will do so. You have less of a mess. If there is no, if you fill it up and somehow have a one-way valve where it continues to receive, but there's no corresponding way out, ultimately, what do you do when you've considered when that creates an explosion? It will burst the pressure of the continued flow or in of, 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 of entity in a finite container. Well, ultimately, the pressure will, it has to go somewhere. It will expand where such the pressure, uh, there will be a, a tug of war between the container and the containee, i.e. the energy. And the phenomenon manifests as a top or a bottom. Let me come back to your question. Yes. The documented, let's say 67% of the time, that is a generalization because different techniques in particular have um, more, um, um, uh, have different statistics associated with them. There are, there is a particular planetary relationship that works 92% of the time. I'll, I won't specify because I want to tease you just so, so in case, you know, to let you wonder about that. By the way, folks, the, I want to give credit. Uh, I am simply, I'm a messenger and, and I am a utilizer. I, you know, I use these techniques. Um, I didn't come up with the, I have come up with some things, but for the most part, the things that I have discovered today or presented today, I didn't come up with. Uh, many, you know, people like GAN uh, in particular, uh, um, uh, uh, Jensen in particular, uh, and, and even some of the uh, scientists and natural thinkers of, of, of days gone by. A lot of the principles, uh, curiously, Fibonacci, um, uh, uh, Leonardo, uh, Newton, um, a lot of natural thinkers and market, and not only people directly involved in market, but came up with the ideas we're applying to markets from an energy standpoint. But no, I have a spectrum. Um, I would say overall, there are some techniques for timing that work very, very high accuracy. Again, 92% for my money, okay, I have some specific cyclical com uh, relations that work out 92% of the time over a sample set, uh, you know, thousands of episodes over a long period of time. So depending, for those of you who understand nonlinear theory and chaos theory, and I utilize that, that's different, but, you know, it's more the time period uh, you have to give equal weight to the period of time for which you evaluate price action 
the idea being that you can have an assortment of regime types of market behavior occurring the longer the, it, you know, this is not just the number of samples, you know, in, in more traditional statistical analysis, sample size is critical and key to the exclusion of time of runtime for the system. But in nonlinear theory, when you go to a, what's called a Pareto-Levy distribution of understanding distribution analysis and whether it's a Gaussian distribution or a, uh, some type of deviation from a, non, you know, a, Gauss, a pure Gaussian distribution of, 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 of type of price action, uh, nonlinear theory is a broader paradigm that, allow, that says not only is the sample size important, and by the way, just assuming you have a lot, you know, too large a sample size, you have a problem as well. Too short a sample, too small a sample size uh, skews inappropriately our statistics for any phenomena, be it price or time, so too does too much sample. Because there is, you begin to have a memory, a loss of memory of those samples that are too far back in the past. So analysis, statistical analysis of any sort, traditional or non-traditional as, you know, as applied by say non-linear or chaos theory uh, has to be very, you have to look at it very carefully. But I would say in, as a broad resolution of a, con a conglomeration of all the varying types of time techniques that I use, say 67% accuracy, but again, I am doing that to be conservative. I'm, that's my response to you. Um, and also take into account, remember, I'm, I'm combining that now with my price analysis. That in general, when you bring out, when I see uh, a divergence or a particular price relationship, let's say that I know has a certain standalone uh, uh, correlation of, of success or, at, or reliability, that I combine with, what, if it's manifesting at a point in time that has a 67% uh, reliability, that I can assume a synergy of, 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 of combination. I'm going to improve my uh, reliability statistics and ratio. But it varies depending on the technique. Okay. Uh, let's see what's next. Are there markets for which this does not work? Again, no. Uh, if it's a freely traded market. The four-month extension of the Greek bailout expires June 30. I am aware of that. I didn't, I wanted, I, you know, th I am, that's, there are always going to be, if it wasn't, Oh, if it wasn't that, it would be something else. Technical, you know, the the fundamentalist is going to cite, oh, let me just get to the question first, or the point. Yeah, I, I think you were just mentioning that as an obvious, yeah, certainly whoever mentioned uh, ER, SCH, um, yeah, clear, clearly uh, Cyprus and the government over in Greece in terms of world equity, world capital markets at large, yeah, certainly the currency, the debt, the equity markets all over the planet are already responding and uh, becoming increasing their degree of sensitivity to fundamental events on that level of perception and understanding. Certainly, that would be an obvious um, vector and and event that uh, you know I call I refer to and think of news events as little packages of information, and information carries the energy into the markets. When Janet Yellen uh, makes a pronouncement, uh, you know, in terms of monetary policy by our century, central bank, that be, is a container of energy. The market, the stock market or stock or the currency markets or the bond market doesn't know anything necessarily explicit about the world external to it. It makes, the way it responds, the transducer of Janet Yellen or the Fed's, you know, the notes being released of the FOMC meeting is the way the market, a stock market or any market, reveals the impact of that is the collective response of traders all over the world. I hear a piece of information, I'm positioned a certain way in a market, and I, in my uh, motivation and internal uh, uh, incentive to profit <clears throat> at all costs, let's say, uh, interpret that information and ask myself, what does it mean with regard, uh, as best as I can piece together, how will the market respond? Will that be good for me at my position or not so good? And I make adjustments accordingly. Or if I'm on the sidelines, I try and piece together a confluence of different pieces and bits of, of, of relationships that might come together for my good. Okay, so yes, certainly the extension of the Greek bailout, uh, which expires at the end of this, um, this month, may be, a, is quite possibly, quite probably, a, a critical uh, real-world factor that could bring about what 
my of our, what my time projection has already said. That would be the superficial manifested causative agent that my projected time point for the end of the month, 29th, given a margin of one or two days of error, might be alluding to. That would certainly be a logical thing. And in fact, if that's what I was trying to suggest, if nothing else, analysis from the charts, from a price and or time standpoint, predisposes the market technician and observer slash speculator to anticipate the, at least generically what type of fundamental events would be consistent with what they're projecting will occur. And two, when you know the best, I had a friend or a coworker of mine Henny Labib, who used to say, what's the sound of one hand clapping? He's, the idea he was saying, the best of all trades occurs when all different types of information collide or align or move into convergence. Because any one type of information, any piece of, any tidbit of information could be bullish or bearish and could be right or wrong. When you, the more different types of information, which are, again, containers of energy, adding to and creating that energetic energetic picture you see on a price chart, when they all line up in spite of their differences, that tends to cre create a higher probability scenario. What's the odds of all of those different things being wrong? Okay, Bryce Gilmore, is the application of chart squaring or, or squaring the chart necessary to achieve timing accuracy? Um, the way you, my literal response, no, but squaring, of I squ that's one of the techniques that works because of the energy, I, and I do, I square time, yeah, I square time and price constantly. And it is an explicit technique, Bryce does, I do, people who are trained. But I was trying, part of the reason it works has to do with some of the theoretical energetic uh, 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 phenomena that I was pointing out today, certainly, definitely. So we are on accord there, whoever made that comment. Pi 3.14, in addition to pi, do I use degree and radian value? Yes. I did, there's only, I am overly, already over my allotted time. I don't think there's anyone scheduled so I can do it, but yeah, for me to get into radians and uh, because as a, I, I, I probably took more math in college than uh, anything else, uh, if not chemistry, which I hated, but I, yeah. So yes, <clears throat> I, I use pi, pi, Euler's constant or 2.718. Uh, there are certain numbers and ratios in particular. Um, as I mentioned earlier at the beginning, there are certain geometric shapes, a circle being the a preeminent, most critically important of all because it has in, infinite symmetry. And then next you have the square and the circle and the, and the triangle. Those are the three most important geometric structures. Similar to that, there are very important constants or uh, numbers, pi, e, uh, the natural log um, is very important. Uh, what else? Um, there's some numbers that are very important. Uh, the square root of two, the square root of three, the square root of five, these are all very important uh, from a standpoint of, uh, for both price and time, uh, numerical. Um, uh, I, there are some numerical concepts that ultimately, I believe, have their origin, again, in these energy, but on the surface, they may seem very different. So I use, suffice it to say, an array of techniques purposely to project time targets when very different, you know, I have some techniques that to a one person who mentioned the intersection of trend lines. Well, I, I used to do that, but I have more sophisticated techniques that, you know, GAN angles, but um, certain trend line applications that aren't, they're very, very particular, drawn at certain angles. And some of these ideas I've come, I've developed on my own, uh, you on the foundation of some of the concepts of the of people like Gann. So certainly, I don't want to think that I didn't do it. Everything that we create, you know, was it Solomon in the book of Ecclesiastes says, nothing new under the sun. Uh, whatever ideas I've come to and I'm employing, uh, I, it has their genesis. You know, I had to first learn some of these techniques that uh, some of the pioneers like Gann and, uh, and even traders today. Michael Jenkins was one of my teachers, Jim Sloman, uh, Larry Pesavento, uh, Robert Miner, all these people, you know, it was a guy when I first started at Merrill Lynch at 24 years old, a guy in our research department who brought me a book on cycles that opened my eyes to the importance of timing. Uh, and his argument at, again, I was open ears, I was wet, up, wet behind the ears, and he said, Glenn, financial markets reflect human activity. So much of human activity 
is a consequence and a function of our daily cycle. Sunrise to sunset. Where does, what's, how does that arise? It's simply the Earth revolving on its axis. If you think about it, that in the earthly cycle is a cycle of importance. If human activity is a function of a certain cycle, a planetary cycle in this case, and market activity in turn is a function of some, a good portion of human activity, wouldn't it make some sense to take a look at some of these important cyclical considerations? It made perfect sense to me then, more than 30 years ago, it still does today. Uh, someone's saying or asking, um, so many ideas, I suspect what you bring to the educational table is a comprehensive system. How, or hence, how long realistically will it take to learn your timing methodology in terms of application? Very good question. It's a practical question. Many of the, some of the ideas are quite straightforward, transparent, simple conceptually some of the ideas are a little more uh, complicated subtle my job to your question I want to respond when I put on my mentoring hat my coaching hat my job is to work as a facilitator and so I remember when I was and I got into this business folks by accident at 24 years old I was heading in a complete well before I entered in I, I had planned on a completely different career I was on a whole different trajectory and I tell people that I work with um, at the constant badgering of my younger brother a few years before I was 24 he wanted me to come listen to a friend of his who was a year younger than I was at 23 was already a multimillionaire and I put him off constantly so finally I, I went and heard him speak and the long the quick of it was I was in complete utter awe and I remember about one quarter of the presentation he spoke for about an hour and I remember one quarter of the way in to the presentation I said to this I said to myself uh, with it uh, with the all jadedness and skepticism that I brought to listen to him because I couldn't comprehend how my younger brother could teach me or show me something that I didn't know how naive was that but in any case um, I was in utter awe at this guy and I said he either either he's way you know he's a complete con artist or I need to learn something about what he's doing and that was my start and that's a that was a primary episode in my life as to why I'm doing what I'm doing and, and did what I did th so thus far in my career in my life um, I am glad that I made the transition I was heading again in a different direction um, I asked I went up to him afterwards and asked two questions at the at grand old age of 24 is do you think it's too late for me to sh shift gears career-wise and if so how do I begin and he said no and he gave me a list of books. The very first book I ever read related to this was a book called Fundamental Analysis. Curiously enough, I started my career as a fundamental by Benjamin Graham. It's the Bible out of which the people like Warren Buffett do their analysis and, and, and investing. It took me more than a year of every day after work going through, you know, pretty much going to the New York Public Library and suffering and struggling through that book because I didn't, I didn't have a background in finance or economics or anything related. I was in the sciences, so I had to learn and get other remedial materials so I could get through that book. That was my start. So the quick answer, I said all that just to give you, to whoever asked the question, how long will it take? I don't know. Everyone's different. We are all wired differently, but I can tell you this. My... The, to the extent I have been able to take in concepts and acquire methodology and repertoire of tools, I can distill and facilitate the acquisition of, of whatever techniques a trader wants. That's part of what I do. Uh, I, have one of my pa I have two primary passions in my existence, my life. One of them is my trading and the markets, and my teaching and coaching and mentoring, whatever you want to call it, is a kind of a logical extension of that. When I first started at 24, the gentleman I just alluded to, in an informal sense, was a mentor to me. I used to call him, I didn't want to bug him, but I used to call him and to purposely wait for, you know, like once a week or every two weeks, because I didn't, I, there was no formal relationship. But I didn't want to unduly bother him, but at the same time, I was so eager and enthused to absorb everything I could so it was a very inefficient process but I did what I did I would read everything I could I IBD investors business daily hadn't even begun again 30 plus 30 more than 35 years ago Wall Street Journal I would read every copy every day 
and not understanding initially what I was reading. They would talk about different levels of the interest rate curve. I had no idea, you know, the short term, the long curve. I didn't know I, the bond section. I would read the currencies, the stocks. The, I would read everything. I didn't know how to short a stock. How can you sell something you don't have? It was a concept foreign to me. And I and I and then I subscribed to Futures Magazine. And then I would 80% of what I was reading initially, I didn't even comprehend. I threw it all in the closet and made the promise to myself that one day I would be able to completely understand that. And bit by bit, your momentum builds and you grow up. I would, you know, I remember reading an article that Wells Wilder wrote in, uh, I think it was Futures, on the Delta Theory, which is a, for those of you who know what I'm talking about, it's a specific type of timing. I got on the phone and called Wells. I called Futures, Mag you know, I, I'm pointing this out to your question just to embellish. However much it takes, how, whatever it takes, what I do now, having gone through a very inefficient process to get myself up my own learning curve, if a person is not aware of some of these concepts, I can clarify that having gone through the, the grunt work of it all, so to speak. So that's part of what I do for traders who are more on the formative stages of their career. I have worked in the 14 or 15 years that I've been teaching with all types of speculators. I have done it all. I'm a technician primarily now. I've traded, op, I do all sectors. I started with stocks. I've done stock indices, derivatives, options, short-term trading, long-term trading. The only thing I don't teach right now and ironically, as I just alluded to, I started my career there. I'm not currently set up to trade off of news and fundamentals. I used to. I used to have in my office all of the you know, financial networks on, trading the news, and have little clever tricks that I worked out to do that. Um, as I began to incorporate more of technical approach, I became more profitable. So that was uh, the reason I transitioned. But in terms of teaching and instruction, um, again, I pretty much do it all except what I don't do, which is, and not that I can't, but I don't, I'm not, you know, there are other people probably who are currently and have consistently been trading via solely a fundamental approach. That's the one primary discipline that currently, just infrastructurally, again, I'm not set up to do. So there are probably other better teachers. Barring that, short-term trading, long-term trading, stocks, bonds, commodities, currencies, options, selling, you know, all of the above, I pretty much do. Okay, that's another question here. The Dow, six, Dow 6.28 pi, very important. Yes, whoever is asking. I am I'm very intrigued. Again, um, I was a physics major, uh, and I ended up taking more mathematics than uh, probably outright physics courses. Um, but so, yeah, I'm a numerical relationships. I've actually done webinars on numbers and the importance of certain uh, functions and numerical relationships and symmetry and I alluded to it although I didn't get into it uh, I want you know I don't know who's in my audience so I want to be general not specific and the mentoring and the teaching that I do allows specificity of, of presentation of information in fact the curriculum that I employ is not embedded in stone I necessarily have a uh, uh, an ample amount of, of flexibility um, and essentially, whatever tools and knowledge and information and approaches and methodology and models I'm aware of, um, I util that's whatever I've acquired over the years, that serves as my kind of informational database uh, by, that I mine and meet out as it is appropriate to the individual trader that I'm talking to based on their current level of understanding and or their interests and objectives and what they're trying to accomplish. And so I think that affects a more efficient uh, teaching relationship okay so yeah certainly you know there's many uh, uh, numerical uh, relationships truly thinking outside of the box so open there's no realm I have one rule in the business from a practical standpoint of speculation uh, make money take money from the markets any however you do that uh, is is open-ended so I anything and everything from A to Z if you feel that may have some practical um, uh, testable objective results and can improve your performance and ratios, uh, so be it. And it's all possibly uh, ripe for consideration. Folks, it looks like we're at, I guess there are no more questions. Um, I think so. It has been a pleasure. Hopefully you got something out of it. Again, if you um, 
have additional questions, we have recorded today's presentation. And um, if you need further inf information concerning our programs, you have the contact information, again, Pacific Trading Academy, 800-339-8588. The person or persons to speak to, normally Frank Cameron doesn't uh, handle this, but um, in, as a, on a, on a short-term basis right through here, because uh, Peter Newman, who normally handles this, um, is out of town, but he, he or either Peter Newman or Frank Cameron would be the people that you would contact to get some a little uh, more information or details on some of the mentorship programs. Did I see another question come in here? Do I do you use the reciprocal of key numbers in your analysis? Yes. So uh, I'm not exactly sure what you're referring to, but you know, um, you know. 1.618, 0 0.618 are reciprocals. One over uh, uh, one over seven. I will I will tease you if you don't know exactly what I mean by that. That is the one seventh. That ratio, that fraction, one seventh, is very important and it enables me to do. And it is specific to equities, to stocks and stock indices. With that fraction, one seventh. So for whoever asked the question um, about reciprocal analysis in general. Uh, I do very specific time projections. I would say it's, it, you know, 90% reliable, just on that fraction. And that uh, is curious. I can, I won't go into the details now. I want to leave something. I'm purposely <laughs> kind of teasing you with that. But whoever asks, yeah. I mean, I can't contain. Uh, um, again, uh, there's, a, there's, there's volume. You can spend years and years. The good news, I, and I got to be careful. I don't. I, I, in my enthusiasm, I might. Uh, scare some people away. Yes, you can spend, there's no end to it, and that's a good thing of the analysis because remember folks, from a practical standpoint, we are applying whatever you know and you know how to do to systems that are not perfectly understood, or at least I don't perfectly understand them. And I always tell students that I tr I'm teaching and working with and coaching, uh, there may be, even in the limits, some alien quote-unquote technology out there that does present a perfect means of projecting the current state of a market and its future state. If there is that, and again, I'm not aware of such, the good news, you know, the interesting irony is if a perfect system were, um, you know, perfectly found out, it became pervasive, ultimately, an interesting paradox is that would ultimately create a disintegration of the market structure because we'd all be doing the same thing. So um, the fact that even assuming that there is some technology that's out can perfectly define a market's current state and its future extrapolated state, I don't believe it's being used all that frequently because if it were, you would see an echo or a, a shadow of its effect in the market. You would see a disintegration of market structure. And I've been in the markets for 30 some years and I don't see it. So even if that's the case, it's not from a prat on a practical level adversely impacting our capacities to be profitable in this business. Folks, it's been a pleasure. Um, we have the webinar special. Fill out the information form when I click the end webinar button. If you'd like to get information or be included on the, um, uh, the, I guess, the raffle that they give, we give a free mentorship valued at $3,300, I guess. Um, you, again, talk to either Peter Newman and or Frank Cameron about the marketing aspects and the, any details that you'd like. Every now and then I speak to traders um, if they have some questions, but you'd have to go through either of those two gentlemen to set that up. Um, and until the next time, um, and curiously we'll be seeing, you can get to see how the events on all levels in the world and at, and at the down lower levels at, at the cycle and time level how these things manifest on an ongoing basis. Again, I find it fascinating and look forward to future topics where we can meet again. Until that time, I wish you a great weekend and profitable trading in the days and weeks to come.